On today's show, we visit Pembroke High School, take a closer look at Duxbury with DPW Director Sheila Scarzi, talk about upcoming things to do in our area, and hear more from local businesses at our pop-up with the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We're glad you're here. Let's go. Beloved heroes of keeping kids fed, we stopped in at Pembroke High School to find out what a day is like in the life of a lunch lady. When we think about all the important people who make a school function, we usually think teachers, principals, aides. But those aren't the only folks keeping the school afloat. For generations, lunch ladies have been a part of the backbone of educational institutions everywhere. But much of the time, these dedicated workers don't get the recognition they deserve. So we decided to come to Pembroke High School to take a look at what a typical day looks like for these unsung heroes. What does a typical day look like for you? Do you have to get up in bed super early? <laughs> <laughs> no, I roll out of bed <laughs> at um, between 6.30 and quarter seven. Nice. Yeah. And what's like the first thing you do when you come in? Well, I say hello to all my girls. I go see Debbie and I ask her, you know, what the plan is for the day. But um, every day is a little different, mm -hmm. which is what I like. What's the best part about your job? When my kids were um, going to school, I had the same schedule they did. And it was perfect. So I was home when they were home, um, you know, vacations, all that. So I could, I could be home just to, just to be with them. And it got me out socializing and... I get the thumbs off. <laughs> oh, yeah, that sounds fun. I'll yeah, that, that. That, that, is, that is fun. <laughs> Kids here are so nice. Aww. I get please and thank you out of 98% of the kids that come through the line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All the boys, too. Aww. I know. Yeah, they're super, super nice kids. Yeah, every year after year after year, it's always consistent. They're really good kids here. And the feeling was mutual. We talked to PHS students about how they felt about their lunch ladies. Pat, how are the lunch ladies important to a school? Um, I think they're very important because obviously they keep us fed. But they're all, they're all the nicest ladies ever. So they're always nice to talk to every meal. Like breakfast in the morning, I always come in every morning because free food. So they come in free breakfast. They always make nice stuff. There's a lot of the time there's breakfast sandwiches, there's French toast sticks, there's all hot stuff. And they get here extra early just to make that stuff for us. So that's awesome. And then it's also important because just when you gotta get fed, good connections, they're great people to talk to. I think everyone loves them. So it's nice to have them there. They're just like, I don't know, they add a sense of like community, I guess, like going in there, they all have a smile on their face. It just makes the lunch, like we don't have long lunches, but it makes it feel like a little less like rush, just like their kindness and stuff like that. So why are lunch staff important to a school? I think they're very important. In the middle of the day, they're always just excited to see people. They always have a smile on their face. They always greet you. They're always just nice to everyone in here. And even if you're having a rough middle of the day or something like that, it's nice for to just come in here, say hi to them. They're always just nice to everyone. What's your favorite thing on the menu? Nachos. The kids' favorite is cheeseburgers. Of course. Yeah. Followed by the nachos close second. But what do the students have to say about their favorites? Probably the nachos. Um, they get a bad rep, but I really like them. I feel like there's just like certain kids who really like them and they're we don't have them all the time, so it like makes it a little bit better that it's only every once in a while. Nachos. Definitely nachos. <laughs> that seems to be mm -hmm. a popular. It, yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, Tuesdays when you walk in and see nachos on the menu, it's a good day. <laughs> What's your favorite thing on the menu? Uh, definitely the spicy chicken sandwich. I get it every day. Probably the apple juice. It's kind of underrated. I probably have like nine cups a day, so it's like <laughs> definitely my favorite thing on the menu. Gotta go with the Titan Bowl. It's like it's like the KFC Famous Bowls. Oh. You get the you got mashed potatoes, popcorn, chicken, gravy, and corn. The school lunch has come yeah. a long way. If anyone tells you <laughs> it's anything but that, they're lying. They don't know what they're talking about. The bacon cheeseburger. Always look forward to cheeseburger Thursdays. So. Yeah. Bacon probably, anything, bacon all yeah, day. Yeah, the bacon's all, all good here, yeah. And what do you think is like the biggest misconception about your job? That we don't work hard. Really? Yeah. 
We're lifting boxes and moving stuff around and running around and we got to think on the fly. Like one day our lights went out and we had no power. We still had 50 kids. So, you know, Debbie talked to the janitors and she's like, do what you got to do to get these ovens working because I got 800 kids to feed. And we did it. You guys still got the ovens working and everything? Yep. Amazing. Yep. And we fed them all and didn't break a sweat. <laughs> So Cam, how do you think lunch ladies are important to school? Oh, they're very important because they work hard every day and they always make good conversation and put a smile on my face. The lunch ladies are definitely important to our school because they keep our lunches running. I mean, we have a very concise cycle going on. You go in, you go out, like that. Um, and they're all very, really nice people, so. Turner, why are the lunch staff important to a school? Oh, uh, the lunch the lunch staff are important to a school just because like they they need to care about what we eat and like what's put in front of us and I feel like they like they're a big part that are just like not heard of. I mean, they do a lot for us. They cook meals for us every day and I feel like they have like kind of like a loving caring aspect for the students here. I feel like a lot of students are personal and like close with the lunch staff, so I don't know. I really enjoy them. I think they're a good part of the school. And for a lot of kids, like lunch is their best part of the day. You guys get to be a part Sometimes of that. It, yeah. Yeah. You know, we're not the authoritarian teachers that, you know, have to answer to. We can just come in and be nice and easy breezy. Sometimes it's the best part of their day. We were so honored to hang out with this team of amazing women today. You know, lunch ladies aren't just the folks putting food on your tray. They're the ones asking about your day, making you smile, and making sure all students get the nutrition they need to become the future leaders of tomorrow. Cheers to the lunch ladies, making our schools a better place, one tray at a time. of the Duxbury Free Library invite you to join them on April 7th at 2 p.m. to welcome in spring with a classical guitar performance by John Muratori. The Boston Globe has described John's fleet-fingered playing style as an unleashing of different varieties of tone and color in quick succession a kind of oral iridescence. His live performances have been featured on NPR and WGBH Radio's classical performances, and he has recorded for Albany, Pont Neuf, and Arabesque Records. This two-hour event is in the library's merry room on April 7th at 2 p.m. and is a show for the entire family. Register via the Duxbury Free Library website. The Plymouth Philharmonic and Kingston Public Library are jointly presenting a free string quartet concert for our community at the Kingston Intermediate School Auditorium on April 3rd at 6 p.m. In a, a History of Music, the Chamber Ensemble will perform pieces from an array of eras that will include Baroque, Classical, Romantic, and Contemporary. Revel in Bach's Lore from Third Suite for Cello, Hayden's Minuet from Quartet in D Minor, Ein Klein Nachtmusik by Mozart, Beethoven's String Quartet No. 13, Schubert's Moment Musico, the String Quartet in F Major by Antonin Dvorak, and Lieber Tango by Astor Piazzolla. After the 45-minute performance, there will be a brief question and answer session with the musicians. The quartet features Plymouth Philharmonic members Anna Maria Lapointe and Alexandra Labinska on violin, Elizabeth Christensen on viola, and Peter Zayon on cello. No registration or admission. Your attention is all that's required for this free musical event. Next up, Julie Thompson takes a closer look at the town of Duxbury. Hi, today we are taking a closer look at the municipality of Duxbury and specifically at the Duxbury DPW and their new director, Sheila Scarzi. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. This is very exciting. You have been with Duxbury for a rel relatively short time? About five months. Okay, yeah. five months. And before that, you were 18 plus years with the town of Plymouth. Yes. And before that, what did you do? I worked for an engineering consultant um, and most of our clients were municipal clients. So okay. I spent just about my entire professional career in the municipal In the municipalities. Yeah. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to McGill University uh, for undergraduate and the University of Washington out in Seattle for 
my master's degree. In engineering? Yes. Okay, so you're an engineer. I am an engineer, yes. Can, can you talk about some of the um, things that you worked on in the town of Plymouth that yeah. n now you're transitioning <laughs> over to, to I Dutch did Spring. a lot in Plymouth, obviously, 18 years. You see yeah. a lot, do a lot. Um, I was their water and wastewater engineer for about 15 of those years, um, so I'm very familiar with infrastructure. Okay. I was the town engineer, uh, the assistant DPW director, yeah. and the acting DPW director for the last eight months of my tenure there. Wow. Okay, yeah. so a lot of the things that you're doing in Duxbury, you already have a huge amount of experience with. Yes. I if hope not so. everything. I would think <laughs> I almost so. everything, right? Uh, yeah. So... The things that the DPW does, before we talk about the big thing, mm -hmm. which is going to be your new um, facility, which everyone's very excited about, yes. is DPW does animal control and animal shelter. You do a cemetery and a crematorium. Mm -hmm. uh, a, you do administration. You do the administration, your fleet maintenance on all fleet the fleet, yep. right? Uh, highway. Yes, highway. So all, the, all the roads. Lands and natural resources, sewer, snow and ice, transfer station and recycling, and water. So you basically... All of yeah, the infrastructure comes under all. you. Yeah. It all comes under yes. your department. Yep. Okay. And how many people do you have working in that department? So we have 48 full-time people and two part-time. Wow. Staff. And two part-time. Okay. Yep. That's full staff. So. Yeah. When you're yep. full staffed. Yep. Okay. What are the unique challenges um, that Duxbury has that maybe you haven't seen in other places? So Duxbury, being a coastal community, um, is very vulnerable to storms, uh, wave action. Yep. Um, so I've definitely experienced that already. You sure have. Um, in my five months there. Yep. Uh, we've had some very powerful storms, flooding. Yep. Uh, flooding is definitely something we're looking at um, that I want to get a better handle on what our stormwater infrastructure looks like. Right. What can we do? Uh, there's only so much you can do with the ocean. Yeah. Um, a lot of the storms we've been seeing in recent years have become more intense. Yes. So I know, I noticed that at Plymouth, we, um, and seeing this in Duxbury as well, just the erosion from those storms, you have that intensity of rainfall. Our stormwater systems can only handle so, so much, much rain yeah. in a period of time. Yeah. So there's that. Um, our, we have a lot of tree cover in Duxbury. Yes. So when you have storms, a lot of tree limbs are down. So there's that challenge. You also have a lot of um, above ground utilities in Duxbury, do you not? Uh, you mean uh, electric? You know, yeah. Yes. So you because have power it's an older town. Yeah, yeah, associated with storm activity. Right, right. So Duxbury appears to get hit pretty hard yeah. with storm activity. Yeah. So that's a, a definite challenge. Um, something else I'm always cognizant of as an engineer and my background. Um, in utilities is infrastructure. Right. So understanding our subsurface infrastructure, where those weaknesses are, what pipes need to be replaced. Okay. Drainage, uh, bridges, culverts. Um, so there's a lot to yeah. get a handle on, um, and I'm still just getting my feet wet. And so. I don't think people really realize just how much this is. I mean, this is yeah. this is this is. For everything from underground to above ground and everything in between, you're, you're kind of responsible for. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, so a, it, it's a big job. Yeah, DPW basically touches um, every aspect of people's lives from when they turn the water on to even end of life with the cemetery and crematory sure. services. And whenever so, there's a storm or when, whenever the uh, first responders are needed, yep. they have to be able to travel over safe and appropriate roads. Yes, yeah, so we're yeah. the first out on the roads to make yeah. things safe. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, Duxbury, a, a lot of towns um, end up replacing all kinds of municipal buildings, and it seems that the DPW is always the last building yeah. Yeah. or the last department <laughs> that gets actually, yeah. you know, refurbished. Yes. So, very exciting. Talk about the new DPW yes. um, facility so that's being built. So, we have, yeah, a new $26.4 million DPW facility. Yeah. Um, we're at the final stages of reviewing the plans, getting it ready to go out to bid hopefully this spring. Yep. Um, it's going to be about 36,000 square feet, um, and it's going to house our entire operation right. um, in one location. Right now it's pretty disjointed. Myself and the administrative staff and water and sewer are based out of town hall. Yep. We have highway vehicle maintenance and lands and natural resources out of the old DPW barn. That's in really rough shape. Yep. So. We're going to have this new facility where we're all housed together. Yeah. We're able to operate uh, cohesively in sequence, and it's, it's going to be um, it's something the town of Duxbury deserves. Yeah, they Not absolutely do. Not just the staff, but yeah. the residents. Now, the plans, are these available on the website? Uh, not yet, because okay. they're, they're finalizing them. 
Okay, so, but when they are, people will yes. be able to see it. Yep. And I know and that people can stop in my office. I'm happy to show people. Oh, great! The plans. If they have any specific questions, yep. I know that we did a, a video for you for town meeting in 2022. I think it was. Yep. Um, that talked about the need of a. Yes. Of a, it just kind of showed this is this is the situation. Right. This is what you have. Voters, you can decide if you want to, you know, if it's time for a new facility. And they overwhelmingly said yes. It's yeah. time for a new facility. Yeah. So that, that video is available yes. um, on our website, and I think we have it on yours also, if people want to go back and review it. So talk to me about the, um, the, the surprises when you got to Duxbury. What surprised you about Duxbury? Probably, actually, the most surprising thing ha has been the residents, how wonderful the residents have been um, to work for and work with. Uh, Duxbury has an amazing talent pool of residents, and there's so many of them that are willing to or and want to help out yeah um and lend their expertise and services to better their town so it's been a pleasure oh um, isn't that wonderful that's yeah, so wonderful to hear yeah yeah, yeah. It, and it you really as, a, as a new employee yes. in the town that must have been very heartwarming it is um and it's still a, a little bit odd to get used to for me um but i've really been enjoying it yeah so so what what do you see are the biggest challenges over the next year and a half, two years, before your facility uh, is done? Yeah, that probably is going to be the biggest challenge, working around the construction of that facility. So it's going to take about 18 months to two years to construct, yet we still need to operate out of the existing facility. The yeah. facility is being built on the same site. Yeah. Um, so it has to be sequenced yeah. um, strategically. It's going to be tight. We're already prepping things, cleaning out areas, but you're going to have a whole construction crew, yep. a lot of earth removal, and we still need to operate. We still need to be ready to respond to storms. Right. Um, so th that's going to probably be the big, biggest challenge for us within DPW, just to maintain our services and to still operate seamlessly. Everything that you have to do, right. Yeah. I'd like to thank Sheila Scarzi for being a guest today. If you'd like to see the entirety of this interview, please visit the Local Scenes Government Services YouTube page. Through the use of sign language, individuals who are deaf can engage in meaningful conversations, share their experiences and emotions, and foster a sense of belonging within their cultural community. American Sign Language, used predominantly in the United States and parts of Canada, fulfills modern and foreign language degree requirements in many high schools, colleges, and universities. For the 9 to 11 year old interested in beginning to learn to sign, the Pembroke Public Library is offering ASL Hour on Tuesday, April 16th from 1 to 2 p.m. This workshop will be taught by a special guest who, as a deaf person from birth, has used ASL and signed English to communicate their entire life. The program will wrap up with a fun game of ASL Bingo. Register through the library's website or by calling 781-293-6771. Author, artisan, educator, historian, and Aquina Wampanoag, Linda Coombs' young adult book, Colonization and the Wampanoag Story, is the story of early America, told from the perspective of New England indigenous people who were living in harmony with this land when the colonists arrived. On Tuesday, April 16th, from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m., join Linda at the Plymouth Public Library for a book discussion and question and answer session on this consequential history. The discussion is best suited for ages 10 and up, but children as young as six are welcome. Please register each child individually via the Plymouth Public Library's website. Each will receive their own free copy of this important book. This event is made possible through a donation from the Jennifer Kane Scholarship and Charitable Trust. Their support for local businesses and economic initiatives makes the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce an integral contributor to the future of this area. Here's part two when Tiff and her crew popped up at the annual meeting. I am with the one and only Sheila Vaughn. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. How since the summer, how's everything going at Cape Cod Community College? Well, things at the college are exponentially just blown up with our Mass Reconnect, which is a free college for over 25. And so we are doing really well. The spring semester just kicked off on Monday, and so we have lots of new students and returning students, and it's been so fun. Can you talk about how the Chambers contributed to the success of the college? 
Oh, absolutely. The college really has a great relationship with the with the chamber. We go to all the events, of course, and the Waterfront Festival, which is one of our favorites. But we work really well with them in the Plymouth area to be able to get our name out there and to be able to say, hey, you know, we're part of the community and we really love working with them in any event, any community event. We are here. We're happy to be here and we'll always, always support them. Well, it's so great to see you. Can't wait to see you again soon. Yes, I can't wait to see you again too. Have a great day. <laughs>
Join local poet Bill Alberti at the Adam Center in Kingston to learn more about this creative literary genre. In this Mixing the Mediums Art and Literature workshop, Bill will introduce the art and ekphrastic prose and poetry of well-known writers and help guide or encourage you to write your own short piece. No writing expertise is required to participate. Bring a notebook, pen or pencil, imagination, and an open mind. Bill Alberti is an artist, poet, musician, and retired English teacher who facilitates creative writing workshops. His poems have appeared in journals, newspapers, and online publications, and he has published five chapter books of poetry. This program is made possible by a grant from the Kingston Cultural Council, a local agency supported by the Mass Cultural Council. Visit the Kingston Public Library to register. Terrifyingly close, World War II saw German submarines patrolling the east coast of the United States. One was captained by 29-year-old Eric Werdemann, who set his U-boat sights on Heredia, a freighter with 62 souls on board, including the Downs family, Ray, Ina, and their two children. This true story of an American family in the crosshairs of war is the subject of So Close to Home, a fascinating portrait of determination and struggle for survival at sea. On April 10th, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., Join author Alison O'Leary at the Pembroke Public Library as she presents this unforgettable narrative with dramatic images and quotes from Commander Werdemann's War Diary. This inspiring and educational multimedia talk is for all ages and will be followed by a book signing of So Close to Home. Alison O'Leary is a journalist, magazine editor, and former Boston Globe correspondent. So Close to Home is the second book she has co-written with best-selling author Michael Tugius. Visit the Pembroke Public Library to reserve your spot. Let the good times bowl at Plymouth Pride's next gathering. Join fellow LGBTQIA folks for some fun and frames at PIMS on Wednesday, April 10th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Play arcade games, try axe throwing, and strike up some friendly conversation as you enjoy food and beverages with friends and found family. And you'll have a bowl. No registration is required if you're coming to eat and hang out. If you'd like to work on your bowling average, it is recommended to call ahead to reserve a lane. Kids must be accompanied by an adult for this all-ages event. PINS is located at 101 Kingston Collection Way in Kingston. The Plymouth Public Library invites kids to go wild about environmentalism at their Wild About Reading Sustainability Storytime on April 12th at 4.30 p.m. Each month, this program has stories and activities that teach kids an understanding of nature and encourage a love of the outdoors. Books are chosen to appeal most to children ages 5 through 9. Registration is required. And that, my friends, wraps what's good and good to know this week on the local scene. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. For more of what's good and good to know on the South Shore of Massachusetts, hit the subscribe button and thank you for watching.